No. Uh, now you're going to get to know Cliff. Some of you guys should know Cliff already. He you bust your ass. Yeah, you probably even bust your ass since I was 11, 12 years old. Cliff used to make me sick, man. He's in the building now. So let them know you're here, man. What's good, man? Let's get to eat. Hey, I got some questions. Oh, I definitely got some questions for Cliff, man. I'm going to tell y'all a story about Cliff. Cliff used to come to these fucking buildings from 164 on this bike and wake everybody up at 10 a.m. in the morning. My grandmother loved him. I hated his guts for doing this shit. But one thing about Cliff, though, he definitely makes everybody in that building better. Any nigga that played ball in that building gonna tell you. Cliff knocking on your door, you coming out that door. My grandmother used to be like, Cliff here. I used to be like, fuck, he here already. I'm thinking he gonna miss a weekend. That he was, was the good days, man. Yeah, like, everybody was, liked to play ball. Yeah, that's when everybody liked to play ball, Cliff. We was in there, 90, 100 degrees. Brief. Now you don't see nobody in the park. Yeah, I hate this era of basketball now. I hate these kids now. That's what I'm gonna say. I hate them, Cliff. Right. They don't play ball. All they want to do is be on their iPhones and all this nonsense. So we here, man. Cliff, where you from, man? A lot of people don't know, but I know. But you tell them where you from. I'm from South Jamaica, Queens. Um, 107 to 164 is my block, born and raised. Um, but I also started going to the bricks about probably like nine years old, nine, mm -hmm. ten years old. So I also ripped the bricks also, but I'm from um, 107, 164. That's my block. Yeah, so of course, man. What's the pressure of being a New York City point guard? The pressure of being a New York City point guard. It would have to be probably all the things that's off the court. It have nothing to do with like on the court. I mean, like just the stuff. I mean, that's and probably every in the city. Yeah. Like just following the wrong crowd, following the wrong things. Probably your your hood is probably drug infested, and most of us grow up with not without both parents. So yeah, I you think that's a key. Yeah, so cool. Who was your favorite player growing up? Um, Kenny Anderson, by far. Wow. Probably I always wanted to know this. I was like, out of all players you pick, you pick Kenny Anderson. Probably because he was a lefty for one. You know, we lefty. Uh -huh. And he was from Queens, and he's from New York. Yeah. And he was probably like one of the first guys that was doing it and doing it big for the city. Yeah. When I found out you was a left hand, I said, why do you like Kenny Anderson? Then I watched the tape of Kenny Anderson. I said, I understand why. Right. But I used to try to patent everything behind you. Right. Watch you. I'm like, damn, he doing all this, putting the ball back here. Let me try some of that. And those are all the things I stole from him. <laughs> <laughs> Watching all Kenny Anderson high school tapes. Man. And everything he did, I tried to do, even from wearing the same number. I'm about to say, then you wear the same number as 12. Right. All right, so who introduced you to the game of basketball? Uh, a lot of people don't know, my older sister put the ball in my hand. Sure? So, yeah, that's who started me out playing. She was kind of like growing up, she was a tomboy. But she stopped taking it serious like when she got to high school, but she put the ball in my hand about three years old, four years old. Yeah, she was on her Cheryl Miller type yeah, thing. Yeah, she was just taking me to the park every day, every day. We had a court on our block, so it wasn't hard. It yeah, just go right you there. You walk down the block walk and go down right the block there. And I'd be on the court all day. And then when I got about seven or eight, it was over for her, cause that's when I really started getting good. I think so. <laughs> it was over for her. She, she so the younger stages, no she was beating you. Yeah, but when you got seven, me. eight, that was quick back. I got eight, nine, it was over. She put it down, and I was ever since then I ain't never put the ball down. Now in fifth grade, you was introduced. You was noticed by one of the biggest basketball camps, ABC, right. back in New Jersey. How was? How did you feel about that? Um, and they took notice to you. That whole situation, it was just kind of like being at the right place at the right time. My godfather, who well, he's like my pops, yeah. Clarence. Uh, his son was playing at the time at ABCD. His son was Dion Jones, who was playing ball. He played Division One too, also. And I was just there, but everywhere I used to go, I used to always carry my ball. But at that time, ABCD was like for all the best yeah. high school kids in the nation. And every time a call was open, I would just go on the court, start dribbling. Yeah. And being at that camp was like days in a row. I was up there every day, just every day. It just got out more and more. Like, yo, this kid with right here could really handle the ball. So I just, every time the call was up, I just ran out there with the ball dribbling. They said people were trying to take the and ball they from the older dudes. Right. They couldn't take it. And then that's how it all started. Older kids trying to take the ball from that's in the camp. They couldn't take the ball from me. They betting money on who would take the ball. And, and they just, from there, it just blew up. Now, how do you feel about the New York Post was publishing stories about you calling your prodigy? I mean, 
at that go. time, everything at that time, you really don't know what's going on because I was just so young. Yeah. But now looking back at it, I can say like I was one of the blueprints that mm -hmm. started that. Um, but at that time, it was going so fast. Everything was happening so fast that people wouldn't believe. Like, I was going to PS40. I was walking to school every day from my block to PS40. And it was days where I couldn't even go inside my building or come out the same way with my own classmates because there'd be so many cameras or people there just waiting for me. So things just started picking up real, 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 real fast. Yeah, and as a young kid, you got these people running up on you. You got them writing newspaper all the roof. The right. New York Post, they really don't write nothing good about a black person. Right. And they wrote about you twice and had you on the front of it. Right. So and that's was, an accomplishment. Right, it was a big accomplishment. It was around the same time the Yankees had won. So everybody Definitely. was wondering, like, why is this kid on the paper and not the Yankees? And not the Yankees. Right, so that was just, it was real big for me. Now at a young age, you was getting letters from colleges like Kansas and USC. Did you know what the hell that was going on when they sent them letters? Because you were in elementary school and you getting letters in junior high and you getting letters from college. Right, that was the thing. Like, see, my family not really into sports. Like, yeah. and once Clarence watched me grow up, so it ain't like he just popped up yeah. and tried to take me up. He he grew up with my uncle, grew up with my family, knew my grandfather, you know my family. Yeah. And it just showed that he was in basketball so much because his kids played. Yeah. So when these things was happening, he kind of understood like what to do and what the steps yeah. and. For me to get a letter from them, that's like high division one college, and me being yeah. in fifth grade it was like unheard of. Yeah, that definitely was unheard of. Right. I like to say this right here: you was the first Sebastian and the first LeBron with all of the hype. Right. Did you feel like that? Cause I felt like that before it was them. It was cliff, cliff, cliff everywhere. Right. Um, I think not to sound cocky, now, I think if if I would have never left New York City, like not left, but if I would have handled my business, yeah, then I think. Me and Sebastian would have been like a great match for New York City for everybody to see what people wanted to see. Yeah. Cause that was the talk from, he's younger than me, but uh -huh. that was the talk when I was growing up, I used to hear his name. Yeah. And then we went head up a couple of times out of Coney Island after Stephon Marbury yeah, had a Stephon tournament. Stephon Marbury tournament. So that was kind of like everybody's waiting for. Yeah. Me and, me and Sebastian went head up too. My people didn't support us like that. Right. They thought Sebastian gave us 30. But for you, Rail, he only had 12, and Tegu had 10, and I had 7. Right. And we won the game. I just want to clear that up. <laughs> but I know you and him had a couple matchups. You got the best of him, a couple of them. Right. I was happy about that because everybody was like, he bust your ass. But I'm like, he ain't busting clip your ass, though. Right. One time, that uh, me and my, my good friend, my best friend, Dion, yeah. it was like a real epic game. It was like 12 and under, 13 and under, probably. We uh, played them in the championship at Coney Island. They actually won the game, but the game went into like four overtimes. Yeah. Park was crowded. Park was real, real, yeah, real. Tell them how that Coney Island park, because it ain't really no getting out for a queen. Right, nigga. that's what people don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the park was hectic. It was, park, it was a cage. It was a cage at Coney Island. And there was so many people in the park that it looked like how Dykeman was mm -hmm. is looking now. And as we playing, you got them yelling like, y'all ain't going to leave here safe. But at this time, like, me, Dion, my little man Wes. At this time, we, we got hot, so we wasn't ever worried about yeah. that. It was a good game. It was a hell of a game. Like, it's probably one of the best games I've been out there. The crazy thing, when we played Lance Stevenson out there, and right. the same thing happened. Right. Sebastian was actually there. Right. They started turning on him, talking about they ready to rob him and all that. Yeah. They surrounded the court. We, we actually beaten Lance and them. Right. I don't know how we lost the game. Because we didn't lose the game, but we lost the game. Right. The Brooklyn dudes is like, yo, they ain't leaving here. They right. found out we were from Queens. They was on the basketball court with us. Right. I said, oh, I, I can't never play out here again. Yeah, that's Coney Island. Yeah, Coney Island is sick. <laughs> if you played in Coney Island, you made it out, good for you. That's a fact. Because <laughs> you definitely ain't made it out there with a nature on it. Now, you was featured on Rosie L. Donald's show, Oprah Winfrey's show, to showcase your skills. At a young age, a lot of people don't get Rosie and the Oprah. What were you thinking about? I don't know, man. Like, First, I was just thinking I was getting out of school a lot. Like, <laughs> shows. like I was out of school. So that was the best part. But it was like, like I said, it was happening so fast that it was big for my for my family, yeah. for something like this to be happening, especially for my community. Yeah. And for me to get noticed just off playing basketball, like God giving talent, yeah. that was just a blessing for us. Now, a lot of people don't know, it's not even the talent, it's your IQ that takes you above everybody. Right. And you had a high IQ at a young age. Right. Five years old, you out here playing with grown men and they can't do nothing about it. Right. What you thinking about when you trashing grown men and you only 11, 12 years old? 
Um, see, that, that's the key. I think a lot of people don't know. That's why a lot of people would say probably I fell off. I don't think I ever fell off. I just think at the young age, I was just ahead of my time. I, my IQ was much higher than everybody mm. else that was my age. So then after a while, they just got to the level where I was finally at. Yeah. And I think that's what happened with that. But I think a lot of people are probably better than me right now. Shoot better than me, faster than me, jump higher than me. But I think they don't think the game like how I think the game. Well, a lot of people don't think the game like you think it. Now, you went to Springfield Gardens, and then everybody just started writing you off. Right. I did a year with you when you was in Springfield. Right. And then you just upped and left. I was tight. <laughs> I ain't going to lie. Cliff was my cutting buddy. Right. Like, Cliff, you say, like, you ain't going to class. I was like, oh, I ain't going to class. Then you left, and then the people just start writing you off like, oh, Cliff is finished when he got there. He didn't play for Springfield. He's done. How do you feel when people saying that, like, Cliff is done? That's, that, story, that whole story is, is crazy because, for one, I wasn't even supposed to go to Springfield. It just, wasn't. it just so happened that was my zone school. I was supposed to go to Kavanaugh school like all my other peers that yeah. grew up with me. But what happened was I was supposed to go to Rice. I never went and took my placement test to go to Rice. Uh -huh. So when school rolled around, had I had to go to Springfield because that was my zone school. And at the time, that was like I had to go. But my mom, I told her kind of late, like I had to go take this test and school's but like a couple of more days. So she like, boy, you're not going to Harlem. Take some tests. I know nothing about this. You going to Springfield? So, but what people don't know, like a lot of people don't even know I went to Springfield yeah, like, the a lot first of couple didn't of months know at all. Cause I was going to every class. Nobody seen me. Cause I was kind of like embarrassed of going there. So yeah. I didn't really want people to know I was there. So, and then it just so happened I came late one day. <laughs> <laughs> I came late and the lunchroom was popping. So I asked somebody like, yo, why the lunchroom look like this? Like, why are so many people in? They like, yo, it's like this every day. Like around, I'm like, around this time? They like, yep. So I made sure every day that I was you made it at that time. That's Springfield was the best lunchroom <laughs> That's in any high school. And after man. that, it was over. Like, you wanted no to play cards, you wanted to be around these girls and all that? Gamble. Just, just be late. Whatever, yeah. <laughs> just be late. You ain't never got to go nowhere. Right. Well, now, Cliff, man, what made you go MIA from basketball? What you mean, go MIA? Like, you was off the scene for a minute. After you went to school, when you went to Springfield, oh, uh, people would call it MIA. I just call um, had to go and get my grades right. It was a uh, situation that was presented to me by Nate Blue. Nate Blue is kind of a guy that helped a lot of New York City basketball yeah. players. Charlie Villanueva, Mo Harkless, like uh -huh. he has all them type of guys. Uh, he called my best friend Dion Merritt. Yeah. He has a situation with a prep school that was out in Florida. Yeah. But Dion had a situation where he was good already. Yeah. He was just like, yo, send my man, send Cliff. Yeah. So it was a kid already down there that was from uh, Harlem. He went to Rice. What's His name that? is Lou, my man Lou Rodriguez. Right. And he needed a roommate. So they, they just needed somebody to go down there. And I asked my mom. At first, she wasn't fond of it because yeah. I'm going to live with a family. She, she never met, never met her in life. At all. They don't know me. So she like, at first, she was like, no. But then I had to explain to her, like, Mom, if this is what I want to do, play basketball, this is what I, need to be. I, I need to make this move. And she let me do it, and it turned out to be the best thing that I ever happened. To say that. Now, now that you moved to Florida, and you, um, what's the name? you went to Florida, went to school, what impact did Stephanie, that's, um, Stephen and Nancy Davidson have on your life that you start calling them mom and dad? Um, just for them to take us in, like, from from us being from New York City, them knowing nothing about us, at this time they don't know if we could play. They don't know nothing. They don't even know how good we are. They just know that these kids need an opportunity in books. And just basketball is just what they do, what they looking to do, but they need the books. And for them just to accept us from who we are and us come from different backgrounds. They don't, if people don't know that they, they are a Caucasian family and we black, we from the, he's from Harlem, I'm from Queens. We going down to Ocala, Florida, probably with never a lot of people never heard of. I never heard of that. Small town. Very small I never town. heard of that. So just for them accepting us as they child. Yeah. And that was exactly what they did. They made sure we had clothes on our back, food on our table every day. And we we didn't have to worry about nothing but school and basketball when we was there the whole that was, whole three years the was there. Thing. That's the best thing you could ever get. Like just focus on what you want to focus on. And that's a, and to this day I still speak to them daily. Daily? I just I just lost him. He he had, he passed away of cancer, yeah, so I, I make sure 
I call her every Sunday and we talk and I just check on her and make sure she's good. So that's always gonna be my mom and dad for life. Like How they did that took care of me. You, well, it happened when I was do, uh, doing my season and playing in Canada, and it just so happened that we had a fan that was fighting cancer itself, wow. and he was a very big fan of our, our basketball team. And around that same time, I had got the call that he was sick. So when that situation happened with the kid, he was a young kid. He was married. He was real young. But he just, his wishes was just to see us play one last time before he go. Wow. So when that happened, that hit us hard. And then when this was happening with him, I was kind of in a rough situation during yeah. the season, playing time, we was losing. And it was all because that I knew he was sick and yeah. I, I wasn't going to yeah. be able to be there like I wanted to be there. So, so it was tough wasn't for me. really focused like it that. It wasn't, it wasn't at all. Yeah, that's crazy. Now being in Florida and you seeing New York City pack Sebastian as the next great one, how that made you feel? Um, a lot of people probably think I was envy, but I was actually happy because it just it was pushing me. Yeah. Knowing that where I was at, I had nothing else to do but school and basketball. Yeah. And the people we stay with, we live with, they own the school. So I actually had the keys to the gym. So, oh, so you could just go I go to the gym like anytime I want. That's what's up. No matter what time, like, just go to the gym. Like, Jarvis got the gym. I was going to the gym. I was in the gym all day, so. I was staying in tune with what was going on yeah. that was, was happening in New York. But every day it was pushing me so I could get my name and buzz back up. Yeah. Now, before your senior season at Shores, you jumped back onto the scene. Everybody wrote you off, but you jumped back on the scene when you right. teamed up with Dwight Howard and Josh Smith and formed Atlanta Celtics. Right. One of the best AAU teams of all time. Yeah, some people say it's one of the best top five ever, ever, of, of, ever, 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 ever. So um, that was big. I mean, when I teamed up with them, they was already good. Yeah. My pops, like my pops is a basketball junk. He knew about them. And I had a chance to play with them before, but I kind of declined it. Because yeah. I didn't really know I was getting into it. So, and plus, I just... Being from New York, I'd rather play with a New, New York team. Thing. So once I got the opportunity again, I'm like, I think I should take this one. And they was already highly rated. Like I knew they was going straight from you knew high, they school, was going high school pro. And they was good already. It's just that they was just missing that one one piece to their team, which was a point guard. Yeah. They was going to tournaments, playing every tournament, but they wasn't winning. Until they got the and, general down there. Right. And then when I got them, we won the biggest tournament that that was that summer. That was uh, Adidas tournament called Big Time. That was out in Vegas. That was their first tournament they won that whole summer. And then after that, they didn't left and went to, to right. the NBA. Right. So, <laughs> after that, they was I was all credit you were putting people in the NBA. You put Wilson Taylor in there. Right. Just let everybody know that. And we gonna get to that story, but I felt you got Wilson Taylor a check and he owe a check. <laughs> that's that's how I feel about it, Wilson. Now, your senior season at Shores, you averaged 21 points and 12 assists. You led the team to 36 wins in the national championship. And you got your diploma out of that. Right. Was that really the best move you've ever made so far in your life? That was the best move I ever made in my life, by far. Like, And it had nothing to do with basketball because I didn't know what I was getting into. It yeah. had everything just me getting on track with school and as a man. And that, that, was, that was the best move I ever made in my life. And the numbers is... Those are the numbers I tell people I average, but I led the whole county in scoring. I was averaging about 28. I was about to say that. I averaged about 28, 28, 29 points. Yeah. And um, I, I won the play the You won the play of the play year. Play the year the whole you time. You was ranked number 47. I was ranked number 47. So everything was starting to roll back around. And we won the national championship because our boy, uh, Terry McKenzie, McKenzie, we down two. We in the national championship game. I get the ball, it's like eight seconds left. I penetrate, I kick it, we down two, he's open. He has a three at the buzzer, we win it. That's so that year we was we was independent, so we played who we want, when we won it. We played 42 games. Wow. So I played 42 games as a senior. So we was 36 and six. Play, like, exactly. School, that, that we don't play that many no, games. We don't get so that many games in high school. You we were just playing, games. playing 42 games. We went 36 and six. Yeah, you won that, and then now you're back on the map, and them college just all coming. Right. Now, what do you think would have happened if you stayed in Queens, though, and not made it that way? That's the only one regret I have about the whole basketball situation. If I would just handle my books, I would just play that Springfield. Because a lot of people would think, well, playing that Springfield, playing that Christ the King or St. Raymond's ain't no different. But as long as you're making noise, they're going to find you. you. 
and that that go to show about me playing in Ocala, Florida. They, they came know. back and found me, so that's the only regret I have. I wish I just had my head on straight. If you would have took that Springfield team, how far you took the shows, Christian think they definitely been at the door. Right, and everybody probably got the matchup they was waiting for. I definitely was waiting for the matchup. Right. But now, now you got back on the map, you got colleges to choose from. A lot of people don't get these colleges to choose from. You had Florida State, you had Maryland, you had Louisville. Right. Then St. John's came knocking at right. the door late. Right. Why didn't you choose St. John's? We all wanted you to come back home. I said, oh, I'm going to the garden if he chose St. John's. But you chose DePaul. Why? Um, two reasons why I chose DePaul was I figured the method I did worked. Okay. I went away from New York City and got right and got my head right and it helped. So me being away from home got me back on track. So I didn't want to come back home playing at St. John's was too close well, to home. We wasn't gonna mess up your life. Girl. Right. We just wanted to be at the States. <laughs> <laughs> right, but I thought that helped and me being away from home, I thought it was the best idea for me instead of being at home. But I could have went to St. John's and they was a little too late. And plus at the time they had Daryl Showtime Hill who's from Queens. From Queens. And we kinda like the same position, but they said we were going to play in the backcourt together. Now, that would have been excellent in the backcourt. Because so, you would have moved him off the one. Right. And, and you would have, he would have been in the two, which I felt he should have been playing right. there. If you would have signed there. Right. And <laughs> that would have definitely looked good for Queens. We definitely needed that. Yeah. But why you ain't choose Louisville? They had Patino down there. Well, Louisville was on the list. They really never really offered. Yeah. And to be honest with a lot of people don't know, that, that the head coach that's at uh, CN Hall now, if he's still there, I don't know if he's still there. Uh, he was an assistant at Louisville. He was recruiting me. He came to one of our practices, yeah. watched me play at and shows. We had a little practice. We didn't have that many players. Yeah. So, and the world got back that he went back and was like, well, he's good, but he ain't as good as I thought he was. Oh, that's and that was the reason why I didn't I didn't choose Louisville. I wasn't. I don't think I was gonna choose Louisville anyway. But they wound up taking the kid from I think a JUCO. Yeah, well, I'm glad. And I think they, they only came knocking because I think they knew at the time Sebastian was going was going to be yeah, a he jump. Was going, he wasn't coming no more. He wasn't more. coming no more, yeah. so I think that was the reason, too. Now, DePaul, you played with Winston, Wilson Chandler. Right. And, like, some will say Wilson Chandler owe oh, you a check. Mm -hmm. How did it feel playing with Wilson Chandler, though? Um, it was great playing with Wilson Chandler. He was one of the best players ever to play at DePaul. Um, first day I seen Wilson on, on campus, we all knew, like, he wasn't going to be there long. First day we played pickup. <laughs> I think he was on a visit. It wasn't even a visit because he already committed. He was just yeah. coming up just to hoop. And he did a move, and I'm like, I just looked at my team like, yeah, he's going to the league. He's he out like, of here? I'm like, he's out of here. He's like, already? Yes, he's out of here. Already? Like, yeah, already? Yeah, he's gone. He won't be here more than two. So I knew I knew he was out of there. Now, the coach said, um, what's his name? DePaul, he loved you. Right. He was just like, he loved that you went through the highs and lows so early. Right. So that's why he said he definitely had to reach out and, and hit you up and get you to the deep hole. Right. How did you feel about him? Well, that was my first coach. Yeah. That was my first coach. The one who recruited you. Right. Mm -hmm. Dave Lado, and it's so funny how life works back. He he recruited me there, and I probably obviously had one of the best freshman seasons at, at the pole. That's probably arguably probably my best year the whole time I was there. And then he wound up leaving, taking a better job. But he was an East Coast dude, and he uh, he, he was born and raised in Boston, right. so he knows a lot about, about the East Coast. So thing. that was the reason he reached out. And it just so happened now that he's back there at the port now. Word. They just rehired they him. They just rehired him? Right. So. After getting rid of that other dude that right. came. Now, how do you feel about that other dude? Because he came in, the new coach that came after he left, right. and then Cliff wasn't starting no more. They bought that freshman off. And then people start going again. I think Cliff is done. Right. Well... See what see what my life is different because I've been through so much so it was nothing that I haven't seen but they when got to recruit people uh -huh. to the style they like so I understood that like yeah. the coach that I had I was his type of player yeah and he got up and left when we get a new coach everything changes everything changes. his style of play coming to effect and his style of play is coming to effect yeah so it was kind of I think him coming from Atlantic Ten and then coming into the Big East was totally different the Big East basketball is you know, hard Wait, call, right. throw that ball down there, get into your set plays. Right. Way Atlanta tougher. tennis, totally different. It's right. like a fast pace move. Right. And when he came, see, the team we had at the pole, people don't know, we was very, very, very athletic. But when he came, he was kind of like a, he was more of a grinded out coach when we should have yeah. been playing the fast, fast pace. pace. And we had so many pieces that I think we could play fast plays and just help everybody. Yeah. But it didn't turn out good. But one thing I would say, like, 
anytime you get a coaching change, if you ain't one of them guys and and this ain't your coach who recruited you, yeah. you should leave. And that's what I should have did. I was about to say, I thought you should have left. Yeah, I should have left. That's what I thought. And I, I said. after my freshman year, I could have transferred anywhere in the country. I broke Ross Strickland, you freshman the assist, the assist record. record. And I could have went anywhere if I wanted to, if I wanted to train, if I wanted to transfer. But my whole thing was transfer. I didn't want to sit out a whole year. At that time, yeah. you transfer. You, you transfer, to you got to sit out a whole year. But now you can transfer. You right. Play they the got these all these rules and tricks and loops where yeah. you ain't got to sit out. Now after college, you graduated, but you ain't get drafted. Right. How you felt about that? Did you know like nah, I ain't getting drafted? Well, I wasn't one of them kids like oh I'm sitting there watching. Like, <laughs> I'm gonna go second round. <laughs> Like, I knew I was realistic to it. Yeah, like I knew it wasn't good. My my numbers wasn't good. It wasn't great. So I I knew my next step was proving myself that I could play. So I ain't like I was sitting around thinking I was gonna get drafted. I yeah. knew I wasn't getting drafted. But it was just about like what I'm gonna do after this. Yeah. Now you got picked up by the Airy Bayhawks. They drafted you in the D League. Right. A lot of people don't go to the D League. They go across seas and right. get the money there. Why you took the D League, bro? I took the D League right because. Because a lot of people don't go the D League route because a lot of people that come out of college who's looking to play professional basketball, they probably have good film from college yeah. or good stats, and that helps you with getting an agent. Yeah. What people don't know is, to this day, I don't have an agent. Yeah. Everything I do is on my own. I was about to say that. So when I went to the D League, nobody helped me. My college and the coach didn't help me. Like, I did that all me and my pops. He, yeah. Like I said, he's a basketball junkie. Mm -hmm. He do his homework on everything. He was like, yo, you might... Let's try the D League route. Yeah. He looks up tryouts. We drove down from New York all the way to PA, Airy, Pennsylvania, yeah, and yeah. I went to a tryout. And the the talent there wasn't that great. It just so happened they had some good coaches that yeah. recognized talent. And I was like the best player there. Yeah. So they invited me back to training camp. Yeah. Where, and it was like 18 players. They had three different sites. They had one in Airy, Pennsylvania, one in the one in Philly and one in Jersey. And yeah. what they do is they take all the players, the best players they from them camps, and then and invite them to the training team. camp. Oh, okay. And then you gotta make the cut from there. Yeah. And there's only ten spots. There's only ten spots? Ten spots. And the reason why it's only ten, because back then you had to leave two or three open. For the NBA for, players. For the NBA come players that okay. come down. So now you gotta make a lot of cuts. So I really had to go in there and take a job. Yeah. Because I'm me, I ain't even supposed to make the team. I came from the weakest city of the tryouts, but it wasn't great competition. Yeah. And my resume is great as everybody else was there. Yeah. So I, I basically had to go in and take what I want. And you and started for the Airy Bay Hall. Right, too. and that's what happened with that. And then you got, last thing you got waved and you was running up on Rio Grande Valley. Right. That's How was not, the experience of with Rio? Rio was great. <laughs> <laughs> People don't like Rio was great. That's what people don't know. Like, I played my first. I was a rookie with Airy Bayhawks. It's only you play 50 games in yeah. the playoffs. I got cut with like play 44 games. I mean, yeah. six regular season yeah, games. Yeah, they released me. Yeah. Cool. I come home. I'm like, man. And what happens is when you get cut, you get placed in the players pool. And so, the waivers, right? In the waivers, where right. any team would pick you up. Yeah. And I played against them during the regular season. They had Smush Parker, and I played good. Yeah. And the coach must have took a liking to me. So I came home, and when I got the call, like, yo, they they, they took your rights. Go. I'm like, man, I don't want to go. It's only two <laughs> weeks left. <laughs> I don't want to go. <laughs> like, it's only six games left. They're not making the playoffs. So I'm like, like. Well, I want to go here. Yeah, like, there's no reason, but you have to go. And, yeah. and it turned out great because that coach was a fast place coach up and down, up and down, up and actually, down. It actually worked for And it worked for me. The last six games, I had about five double-doubles and yeah. only playing about 20 minutes. 20 minutes. I know. I've seen the stats. He was averaging double-doubles right. in the last six games. Exactly. And then every baseball came calling again. Right. That's what they say to that. <laughs> this was like, people don't, like, basketball's crazy. Like, I can't get a break. Like, people be thinking it's me. What happened with that? That coach. They let him go during the summer. Yeah. So they got a whole nother coach, a whole new coaching staff that was from overseas. And he wound up doing a great job. They won about two yeah. year, two championships. They did, actually. But when I came back there for that team in training camp, yeah. he didn't like me. He cut me. So now I get cut from that team where I just put it work. <laughs> but they get a whole new new coach. Same thing in college. <laughs> he give me a body. So looking at that Dave John Rule, hold on. Oh, man. So I go home for about a month. And my coach that I had, he calls me back. They yeah. ain't doing too good. He called me back, gave me another opportunity, and I, and I went back with Aaron Bayhawks. Yeah. Now, 2012 had to be one of the worst years for you. You messed your knee up. Right. 
I was mad. I said, oh man. Now people start putting the writing on the wall again. Right. Cliff is done. Right. How, how was you feeling? Were you, were you happy? And you stood out a whole year of basketball. And you a basketball junkie. I know that was hard to do. That was tough. I mean, a lot of people really, like, will be down on themselves, get out of shape or whatever. But, I mean, I had a lot of thinking to do. And a lot of people don't know, like, that's why when I went to school, I, I started, when I went made that move to Florida, yeah. I started taking, like, Class. school work serious. So that was the whole reason why me staying at DePaul and getting my degree. So yeah. if basketball don't ever work, I have something to fall back on. Definitely. So when that happened, I was kind of thinking like, what can I do if I can't play ball? Can I go the coaching route, training route, whatever? But I just sat out for a couple of months, like four or five months, watched, did a lot of coaching with Rob. Rob yeah, playing every tournament. Did. I was going everywhere. Still, in still tour, around the game. Still around. And then when I sat out my couple of months, I just came back and played. Okay. Did the knee really rehab the full potential again? No. That's what people know. I never did rehab. I didn't go to no... You didn't go... You was that Your rehab was totally different than the normal rehab. Right. You was in the park with us. Right. Doing pull-ups and all that. Exactly. You stripped the knee that way. You didn't right. have didn't doctors go, and right. all that. I didn't do no real rehab. Yeah. I didn't do no stripping in my knee. None of that. I just sat out. They said, you got to sit out for four to six months. Yeah. So I waited four to six, six months. <laughs> and then I just jumped back on the court. Yeah, I didn't I get no like, play, like you could go, I just wait. Now, after that, you bounced back, you took the show and go all the the championship. Right. This is on the street ball circuit, a lot of people don't know. Cliff is the general of the show and all stuff. They call Cliff basically the point guard on the on the floor and the coach on the floor, right. if you don't know. Now you bounced back and took Sean Bell all sorts of many a championship after that year. Right. And you got the MVP in the Rucker League. Right. How did that make you feel? Do you feel like I'm back now? For all the doubters. Um, see, with our team, we got a like we got a great program. So I'm just a piece to to the puzzle. But I mean, we very good. And with that team, I don't got to do much. Yeah. I just got to be a stench of the rod, and that's like even as even though it's street ball, I take it serious. Like if it's yeah. like a professional, like even if I play in the park, I want to win. Everything I take serious. everything You're serious. Everything like, serious is twelve. Right. So I play basketball the right way. So it's not so hard. Like street ball is big in New York City, yeah. and with us. Rod coming in from day one, winning, is like a target on my back. So mm -hmm. every park we go in, there's a lot of people there just to watch us lose. But do you like the pressure? Because y'all under the pressure all the time. When you walk in the park, if somebody took us, I got to bust Cliff ass. It's so crazy. The pressure ain't from <laughs> us. It's from him, our owner, like, and our coach. Like, a lot of people don't like him. So then when we get on the court, they trying to kill us. And then it all come from him because he be talking in. One thing Rod do, he big his players up. Right. He's gonna if his players is okay, he gonna make them great. Right. And so y'all automatically have a target on your back. And that's that's Rod for you. He not only big his players up, he built his brand up. Mm -hmm. And when he out there, he's talking. And when we get on the court, we produce. And when he the way he came in street ball, when you coming from day one, not taking lumps and beatings and bruises like mm -hmm. anybody else do, you coming from the door winning. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. Like. To us, if we don't win a championship, it's, it's a failure. Nothing. So, like, every year we trying to win multiple championships, not just one, yeah. not just two. If we win six tournaments and we don't win four, it's a failure. It's a failure for us. Yeah, and he, he come back to the block, we ain't win nothing. Right. If we ain't win four. Exactly. So, at least get into at least four or five final fours exactly. every year. Every year. So, do y'all feel y'all the best street ball team out there? By far. I feel like we're the best street ball team. Other, well, other teams too, like, but. When you talk about the best street ball teams, our names always going to come up. But you have the other teams like TMPs and from Queens. Yeah, They've been doing it for a long time. You have Bingo also, who's been doing it for a long time. And you have Donald, who's on the He's, he's a, on the rise. He's on the, the rise. Right but now. his team, Usual Suspect. Yeah, Usual Suspect. What's the best matchup that you've ever had in the street ball circuit? Been on the college circuit. Usual Suspect and Usual Suspect. I want to say the best matchup, but some of the best guys I like playing against okay. the street ball. I have to say, uh, Irv Walker, Malik Booth, who's from Queens, uh, Dwight Hardy, who played at St. Yeah. John's, him, and uh, Kiki, Keijan Clark. I know Keijan Clark. Those from Harlem. Those are like the best guys I like matching up with, playing against every summer. I look forward to playing them guys. Yeah, see, you know, a lot of people don't know Cliff be on that Twitter going crazy. Right. Like, if Cliff beat you, you gonna know he beat you. Right. And he calling you out <laughs> all week into the next matchup. It's a fact. 
Now, how you stay in tune with everybody like when you do that? For one, the reason why I gotta make it known because if Sean Bell, <laughs> DD and Sean Bell lose the game anywhere, everybody knows. Like, I don't care where it's at. Like, if our name is on it, we can just be there. If, if Rod a tournament and a couple of guys playing, it's not even our team, yeah, it's already a feeling <laughs> that's Sean Bell we just beat. And it's not even our team. So that's why when we beat these guys and we win these games, yeah. I gotta let people know. Alright, so after the summer you had, you um, signed with the ABL team. Um, Panama City brief. Now rumor had that they stopped paying y'all. Right. What the hell happened there? That's not a rumor. Okay, let's That's go. a let's fact. Clear this up. <laughs> let's clear. It's not a rumor. I see you tweeted the president and all, oh. all of that of the league. So what happened here, man? I don't know. Like I said, like I can't get a break with basketball. Or something. <laughs> like, I mean, well, the it was basically a league that uh, he started up. The dude started up. I forget his name. Well, I didn't forget his name. I ain't gonna lie. His name is Steve Haney. He yeah, I'm about up. to say, you couldn't forget his name. He saw the league, basically, and the league was supposed to be like, you know, it was a new league. I kind of knew it was probably going to be a situation. Bumps right, Bruce bumps and bruises with the money or whatever. But we only got paid for that first month of the league. I don't, I forgot the exact months we was playing, but we only got paid for the first month. And the first check was being that it started like in the middle of the month. It was yeah. prorated, so it was, whatever your salary was, it was half of that. But we wound up playing two extra months just because we loving basketball. Yeah. And at this time, I sat out a whole year. So I'm figuring, like, let me go here let people know that I'm healthy, that's my knee is right. Yeah. I'm going to put some numbers up and get up out of here. Yeah. That's, 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 my that's, whole, that's my whole goal. But let me go back here. And so we play extra. But as I'm seeing, like, nobody going to get in contact with this dude. We got coaches talking to coaches, players talking to players. We emailing them, we texting them. So me being a point guard and every team I go on, I always wind up being like the leader, the leader of the team. So I finally say, yo, we not playing no more. Like, we gonna keep playing and not getting not paid. Getting like, paid. now this is getting ridiculous. Yeah, on your own I'm dime. spending Damn. my own down. Exactly. Even though we had a nice roof on our head, but What's we not it? getting paid. So I I came with the decision, like, yo, we not playing no more. Yeah. No more games. No more basketball till we get another check. Yeah. And that's what happened with that. And I try to, everybody try to contact them the right way. Yeah. But you know now, the new thing is social, social media. media. So being that I couldn't contact them by texting or emailing, I figured I'd take it to social media. And it just so happened it worked. Yeah, because, a lot of people start getting behind y'all, not right. getting paid too. I thought and, I said Kenny Anderson jumping in. Right. So Magic Jones. Because he had in. his name affiliate, even though he, I don't want people to know, he didn't have nothing to do with the league. Yeah. It's just that he knew the guy and he helped the guy push the league. When it first started, like before yeah. it opened up, like yeah, I helped you. You go throw my name in, it's cool, but yeah, it's not yeah, wasn't yeah, his lead. Yeah, to get the name out there, right. you know how people use the face, right? Like Kenny Anderson, right? So exactly. Cool. People that's will what come down to that. it, but because he damn sure answered one of your tweets, right? On that dude, right? And he answered like, yeah, I know him, but that's not my that's guy. That's not my so guy. Like, <laughs> but I also, me and him, me and Kenny had a talk because I knew Kenny since I was yeah. a kid, and I wound up DMing my number. Yeah. He called me and we talked for a minute. And I explained exactly what was happening. He's like, man, I ain't right. So, yeah. I mean, trying to contact him by phone and email, that ain't working. But working. when I got on that, that Twitter, got on that Twitter, you was on there all day on his ass. I was on there from Saturday to Monday morning. <laughs> I got a call from him after that, though. I tell you that much. What he say? Can, can you please stop? Can you please stop? Can you please stop? Can you go up there and delete all the tweets. <laughs> <laughs> it got crazy. <laughs> I said, yeah, when you pass some chicken, though. Well, you, did, he, did he ever pass that? He, wound, he ain't passed me everything, but me being the dude guy, what wound up happening with the whole situation, a couple of us wound up yeah. staying still. And, yeah, you and Tigu, me, Tigu, my man Larry, Larry, who's from Baltimore, and another kid named Johnny, we wound up staying. Everybody left. We yeah. were before there. Johnny wound up going back home, and it, it was a, a, a lady that took us in, yeah. like, yo, y'all can stay with us, because what wound up happening, the house that we lived in, they yeah. kicked us up out of it. They took us from like, y'all gotta go. Because yeah. the owner was supposed to pay, the, well, our coach was supposed to pay the pay bill. That. But being they that he wasn't, left. nobody was getting paid. So, like, coaches wasn't getting paid, players wasn't getting paid. So, the house ain't getting paid. So, we got kicked up out of there. Yeah. And we had to go live with somebody. And one of the dudes that was affiliated with the dude, Steve Haney, he was like a co owner. I guess they was called. He found out what happened. And it's crazy how basketball worked. Like, he went to school with one of a dude that played at the pool yeah. that wound up knowing me and he told him like nah Cliff ain't that type of dude yeah, something, something, that, something, must, ain't something must have happened yeah. for him to be ran like that and then he reached out and called me in that dude wound up paying me some money out of his own pocket yeah. and what I wound up doing is I didn't be 
selfish or greedy. Like the money that he was giving me was like my salary. But yeah. what I did with the dudes that were staying with me, yeah. I split the money with everybody. Yeah. And that's how we did with that. Now this is my last question for you, because it seems like you always have a problem with these leagues. Right. Now you in Canada, two years now. What the hell happened that y'all did not play this game seven of this championship? It was allegedly a brawl. Right. Was it really a brawl, man, or was it no pay coming on this one too? Wasn't a brawl. We know it. Okay. Bro. I just know the it. scuff. I didn't know that. that was that was like regular. Cause the paper they got it as the whole team saw brawling. It wasn't. It was a little scuffle, a little altercation of about two minutes. It was I wouldn't call it a brawl though, but it was a situation that got kind of sticky. But what people don't know, it was a build up. Yeah. Like two teams that was playing for a championship. Yeah. Heat of the moment. Heat of the moment, and this this been happening from game one all the way up to game six. Yeah. But people don't know we I was in the championship. We was in the championship, yeah. and it was tied up three three. And what happened was we were supposed to play, and then. That morning we got into a little scuffle, a little altercation that morning of the game, a little fight. And chairs and stuff like that was wound up being thrown and hit and I we all made a decision. Was it did y'all get in a fight with each other or y'all got into a fight with the team? We got in a fight with the other team. So why did they have both the teams together anyway? It's a long story, like <laughs> we wasn't really supposed to be together. Oh. What <laughs> happened was Y'all made it y'all way to be together? Not really. They before a game, you have a shoot around. Okay. Before every game, you you select it to time of a shoot around. Yeah. On game six, you want, you want time the game is scheduled for seven. Yeah. So you try to have an early shoot around so everybody can do their routine. Yeah. You go back to the room, you do your pregame nap, your meal, whatever, and yeah. you come back for the game. They try to give us a late shoot around, one o'clock shoot around for a game that's at seven. So game six, being that we on the road. Yeah. Our coach declined, like, I'm not taking that, that's too late. Okay. So we didn't even do a, a shooting round for game six. We didn't do nothing. Okay. We just went, didn't do nothing, just went and played the game. So game seven come around, they give us the same time. Yeah. So our coach, like, we not taking that. Our owner says, we gonna go early. Yeah. They were scheduled for the 11 o'clock shoot around, 11 to 12. Yeah. We went at 10. So, I guess them coming in is around 10, 30 around this time. They come in and do they shoot around. They see us on the court. Yeah. They coach is looking like, what the hell is y'all doing on the court? Y'all yeah. scheduled from one, one, o'clock. 1 o'clock, 1 to 2. So I own it like, ain't nobody in the gym. Like, so why we can't we use it? So it was tension while we was there. And one thing led to another, and then we just got into a little situation. And that's what happened with that. And then y'all decided y'all wasn't playing? We decided as a team with our coach and our owner. So as a whole, we that all decided. decided it wasn't safe for us to play that game. Now, you know what this reminds me of? This sounds like some wicked shit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we can say, if everybody ain't getting to this park, we, we ain't playing. Play. So when I see that, I said, oh, Cliff out here taking these wicked tactics <laughs> to Canada. <laughs> right. It was just a lot of things going on. A lot right. of people, I don't really want to. We got this footage yeah. with this Jason Williams. Man. Right. You dropped Jason Williams to Duke. Playing against Durant and all of them. You dropped Jason Williams. Right. Jason Williams was on ESPN. He ain't want to speak about it. Quick. <laughs> so can you tell us what happened, man? What you did to Jason Williams? Well, uh, the game kicked off. as Jason Williams, Durant, David Lee. Yo, how was you and Durant um, face like that? Just t trash talking a little bit. <laughs> and then we had Kemba, myself, uh, Rashawn Bell. We just playing a little pickup yeah. game. And I think Jason, I scored the first basketball in the clay on Jason yeah. Williams. And then um, I think he's coming down the court. He throws the ball off my back, and he is a he is a jumper. Yeah, so the crowd, going crazy. Jim is going crazy. So I come down, and I clear it out. But when I'm about to clear it out, I think David Lee is helping. So as I'm dribbling, I'm telling him, "Hey, why you helping?" Yeah. So then once he leaves, I just do a move. And he bites on it and cuts me off a little bit. But then I spin and he just fell. Uh, I think you <laughs> retired, Jason Williams. He ain't played another pickup game since then. Yeah, he ain't want to play no more. After he ain't want to play no more. After, <laughs> so after you, the move, he's like, I'm going to sit down. Can we say that you retired, Jason Williams, man? He was already telling me to retire. <laughs> no, you retired that whole career. I don't that. think he going to get in no more games. <laughs> no more pickup games? Yeah, no more pickup games for him. All right, man. We know Cliff is a busy man, man, so we got to let Cliff go, man. It was good having you on the show, and this story needs to be told. And you are the first one with the Slam magazine. You was on two of them. Right. You are the first LeBron and the first surpassing Telfair with the hype and the story build up. I don't care who says it, says different, that is the truth. Right. So we're going to let Cliff go, man. 
We're going to throw this up music three stacks. DJ Rough Hands is in the building.